Uh, welcome to our latest Institute of Business Ethics webinar. My name is Chris Cout and I'm one of the Associate Directors at the IBE. For the next hour, we're going to be addressing the question, where does ethics fit in? I uh, hope you enjoy the hour with us. Before we get down to the question, I've just got to uh, check my housekeeping notes and say one or two technical things. If you have any problems with the technology, then just hit the hand, raise hand function and type your question into the question box and one of the events team will try to deal with your problem, okay? If you actually want to ask a proper question, uh, by all means also please use the, uh, use, the, use the question box. You can ask a question at any time. So there will be a Q&A session towards the end of the webinar, but I'll have a list of questions appearing in the box on my screen and, uh, and I'll be able to sort through those. So please, as the questions occur to you, just type them in. We are recording the webinar and the webinar will be made available in the coming days and we will also be live tweeting so if you want to join in with that we use the hashtag business ethics matters and the handle at ibe uk uk is important otherwise you get a different organization as i once found out when i tried to tweet anyway let's get down to business where does ethics fit in over the past decades, you know, many organizations have developed an ethics function, an ethics capability, an ethics team, an ethics group, maybe just an ethics person if they're quite small. But when you look at that, they pop up in all sorts of different parts of the organization. At one level, I always think that's quite encouraging because it suggests to me that organizations are thinking about what they're doing. They're not all just doing something they've been told to do or copying others. So there are plenty of different ways of of pursuing the ethics agenda but what is it that makes a difference why do people go for one uh, organizational approach versus another well i think there's all sorts of different reasons i mean it could be industry for example particularly if you're heavily regulated that might lead to certain pressures uh, from outside also if you've got a particularly strong ethics agenda maybe in your uh, pursuit of purpose and ethical values that might drive you to put ethics in one part of the organization rather than another. And I think sometimes it's just an act of accident of history, isn't it? Sometimes the person who took up the mantle, who first took on the ethics agenda in the organization, happened to be in a part of the organization. And so they started things off and, and things developed from there. But wherever ethics sits, there tend to be pros and cons. And so what we want to do uh, today is to have a little think about what are the benefits and disadvantages of sitting in different parts of the organization? What are the different options that are open to us? And what might these options look like and how do we deal with them? So I'm delighted today to have three excellent panelists to help us think these things through. Not only are they expert, but they come from three different organizations which have taken really rather different approaches to where to put ethics. I almost said where to stick ethics, but I think that would be a little bit rude. Where they place ethics, where they locate it. So they're going to give an introduction uh, of five minutes each uh, to tell you about how they organise things where they are. And the speakers will be in order. Paul Hockley from Mott MacDonald, Dominic Hall from BAE Systems and Jennifer Coleman from NatWest Group. So they're going to tell us something about themselves, where they sit in the organisation, what their core responsibilities are and how they got into this particular position. Okay, so over to you, Paul, to start us off, please. Okay, thanks, Chris. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as you heard, my name is Paul Hockley. Uh, I am currently the Group Ethics and Compliance Officer at Mark McDonald. And I think we'll find by the end of this call there's not a one size um, fits all approach to um, where ethics fits. So, just as a quick introduction to Mark McDonald for those that aren't familiar. Um, we're a global engineering design and management uh, consultancy. Um, global operates in 135 countries, 170 offices, 16,000 employees, about 2 billion turnover. Um, we operate across 12 core sectors um, and regionally focused. And, but when I say regionally focused, it's actually quite a strong autonomy within the regions um, compared to other countries. Um, which actually influences perhaps some of our design decisions. And I joined Mark McDonald in September 2019 as the group compliance officer. Uh, at the time, ethics sat in a separate uh, department alongside 
risk, the health and safety in some in an uh, kind of area called business management systems. Um, and I had to come quickly assess the context of the organisation as far as ethics was concerned and compliance was concerned. The organisation felt that it had ethics in a good place, but recognised it needed something um, more around controls, um, and hence I was brought on board. Um, and I sat immediately within the legal team. But uh, um, for a number of factors, and one of those was overlap of what the ethics and compliance capabilities were being asked to do, I quickly um, kind of came up with a plan and pitched to the executive board that it made sense for these two capabilities to be combined under one program. Um, that program was a tangible program that was built around um, design from the federal sentencing guidelines, the DOJ guidance that we've seen over the last um, few years, and a response to the kind of statutes that obviously cover primarily compliance. Um, the board bought into that idea and agreed the two should come together. And on the 1st of July 2020, ethics and compliance was combined under one program, and I became the group ethics and compliance officer. But um, as, as part of that decision making, we had a couple of key uh, things to sort out. Um, one is where did we sit? Where should it sit? And we ended up choosing to put ethics and compliance within the legal function. Um, there was some debate about that, um, but we went with legal. So I currently report to the group, group general counsel, but I do maintain a dotted line on ethics matters directly to the executive chair. The executive chair is, is the chairman, we're employee owned companies, so our structure, the, the, the executive chair is more hands on than traditional chairman. But that's, I have direct access to the chairman on those matters, which is important. We looked at governance, um, and so I've, we've already set up a, an ethics and compliance steering group that oversees the ethics and compliance programme, and that meets every two months. And that is a small group, but again, it is quite senior, it's got the executive chair, it's got the director of strategy and operations, group general counsel, and myself. So we again, I've, I've got that access, um, and I think which is which is important. Um, and now where we're focused on building out the team, I, I was one person, um, which in a two billion turnover organisation isn't a particularly big team, of course. Um, so we're now we're now looking to build out that team centrally, um, and um, I've already recruited one person who I think is on this call. Uh, Marie, and um, I'm about to recruit somebody who's starting next week, um, Dan Johnson, who uh, is, for those of you who know Dan, there'll be some smiles. Uh, if you don't know yet, Dan Johnson is leaving IBE, and next week he joins Mark McDonald. So I do apologise to IBE for that. Um, but that's where we are at the moment, and that's that's the decision making we've made. Okay, Chris, back to you. Okay, thanks very much, Paul. That's very interesting. I'm sure we'll pick some of that up uh, in due course. We'll turn rather different setup for you at BAE Systems. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, um, so I'm head of ethics at BAE Systems. Um, 85,000 people globally, um, essentially manufacturing and R&D is, is really the core of it. Um, but interestingly, before I was at BAE Systems, I was in the oil and gas industry. Um, a BG group, and I was at Coca-Cola, uh, the Western European bottler there. Uh, when I was in BG group, um, ethics sat within the sort of communications policy corporate affairs department, so I had experience of that. Uh, when I was at Coke, it sat very clearly within legal. Um, I was head of ethics and compliance, um, and that was within legal. Um, and now at BAE Systems, uh, head of ethics, work very closely with the head of compliance, um, but I sit now uh, within the HR department, uh, and we can talk about the pluses and minuses of that, of that later. Um, it, it, it does mean I'm very close to, I sit within diversity and inclusion, employee engagement, employee relations, all those, all those kind of areas there. So there's good access to a lot of levers there. Um, the, the core areas I've got responsibility for as, as ethics are the code of conduct, clearly, um, the ethics helpline and the full investigations process on that. And we get around 12, 1300 contacts a year through that, that method. So there's a lot of work involved in that. Um, all of the 
ethics and compliance online training. Um, so that's compliance have their program, but we look after the training for them. As of now, there was a change to sort of affect that um, because it's seen that training is much more of a hearts and minds area. Um, so we we own that, uh, and that includes the annual training, uh, role specific training, um, any foundational new joiner training, um, and quarterly sort of communication nudges just to keep people little brief nudges to keep people up to speed. Um, and we also have responsibility for the global network of ethics officers, so around 160 ethics officers, part-time ethics officers around the world. Um, it's it, the area is, is evolved a little. I mean, it, it's you can see how it moved as I've moved companies. Um, when I joined BAE Systems, obviously the Wolf Report had been out for a few years. Um, we had a very clear mandate as to, to what we did and how we did it, a very clear structure on that. Um, the key change since then is probably picking up the compliance training as well. Um, and that, that, that move that I was describing before, um, I used to be part, so the, the department I joined was part of the wider corporate social responsibility HSE type function. Um, we're now much more within group HR, so it's that DNI, that employee engagement, much more into that cultural levers of power place. How can you affect change when you're looking at the cultural organisation? We're in the right place for that, I think. Um, it, it is key that we talk, I mean, it's interesting, Paul, that you're, you're the classic head of ethics and compliance. Um, and we do talk, I do talk very regularly to our, our head of compliance um, and their team. Um, and we, we, we make sure we're absolutely on the same page on that. Um, but we do separate them. And that, that separation was suggested by Wolf. Um, so uh, I'm very happy to talk further about um, the benefits and disadvantages of that um, in the rest of this discussion. So thanks, Chris. OK, thanks so much, Dominic. Speakers keeping nicely to time. There's the challenge, Jen. I'm sure you'll be excellent too. So I'd like to introduce Jen now from NatWest Group, who's got a rather different story to tell about where ethics sits within NatWest. Yes, thanks for, for having me, and I'll try to stick to time. But um, yes, yeah, so I'm very, very different um, to Dominic and Paul, actually. I'm not head of ethics. I don't have ethics in my title. And actually, nor does anybody else at NatWest Group. Um, as, as far as I'm aware, I did have a quick look. but we um, have a very integrated approach to ethics. So I guess I'm here to talk about a lot, a, a much broader picture um, within compliance. There, you know, there is obviously ethics applied within risk, within HR, but really I think we've got an approach where um, it's much more integrated. So I personally sit within sustainable banking and I'm very lucky that within my role, I get to see and engage um, with a number of my colleagues on the different ethical issues. Um, I'm personally responsible for social policy and emerging issues, so that's very broad ranging. Um, and as I say, rather than maybe kind of going into what those issues are, I think it's the how um, I interact with the business and see um, the business integrate ethics, you know, from the leadership, from corporate governance, from the board, down through management, across all the different functions that we have, but also through things like our values. Um, our code, and most recently our purpose. Um, so within NatWest Group, we um, our, our leadership is Alison Rose, and when she became CEO, um, we launched our new purpose, which is um, to, really to help people thrive. And we're really now focused on living that purpose and living our values. And there's a number of things um, happening across the business to integrate ethics into the culture of what we do. So I think really it's, it's synonymous, ethics is synonymous with um, culture and purpose within NatWest Group, and it comes to life through that. So, so yes, that's probably, um, I'm sure more will come out as we get into questions and answers, but that's the setup that we have. I'm sure, Th thanks very much, Jen. And, and uh, uh, in terms of your background, are you a banker by background or something else? Um, no, so I'm, I've been within the sustainability team. Um, I've been at the bank um, since 2007, so, um, just before the financial crisis um, and uh, had a number of roles and I think sustainability is actually 
got probably many parallels with um, ethics um, in that I've seen the role and the team evolve um, over the years, what we've been responsible for and what we've integrated. So, um, yeah, I've done a number of different things from, you know, running our community programs, engaging on a number of consumer issues um, and uh, and more wider issues as well. So currently have um, oversee our approach to human rights and modern slavery, but also work closely with colleagues um, on different uh, social issues. So, for example, last year we had a lot by um, big focus on um, racial equality um, after the George Floyd um, death, and I really helped that task force to to think about how we can, you know, be ambitious in our targets and the change that we want to evoke um, as a result of that. So supporting um, different parts of the bank with social issues and really, you, you know, working together and bringing different skills to to those issues. Okay, thanks. I mean, certainly that that theme of um, having a sort of a special group and then integration into what we do is, is, is very common to sustainability and ethics as well as the relationship between them, isn't it? Um, I just wanted to ask before I run a poll, uh, Dominic, um, your professional background, what do, what do you bring to the party in terms of your sort of, are you, are you a lawyer by background or something else? Um, thanks. Um, I'm an auditor, I'm an accountant. Uh, so actually, I, I studied philosophy at university. So I did an undergraduate degree in, in philosophy, postgraduate degree in ethics, um, and then I went into accountancy. I worked at KPMG for seven years as an auditor. So audits, and investigations, uh, internal controls, processes, all that good stuff. Um, then I moved to the oil and gas industry in group finance. So I had that kind of role, and then moved across into sustainability. And, and very quickly into the ethics field. And I, I really feel that having that business background is, it, it helps, it, yeah. it gives credibility. You'll often meet someone who's senior vice president of ethics and compliance, whatever it is, and they have a, um, and they go, oh yeah, no, I was involved in driving tankers for 30 years within the business. Uh, that was my role. I was, a, I was a business leader in this area. So I really understand the impact on the business there. And, and now I'm doing this role. But it's a different back. It's fascinating. No two people seem to have the same background in this field. Um, but for me, that, that audit background was, was the rigor. And then being in, in business is, is helpful too. Yeah, and I think that can sometimes affect the way in which particular organizational structures play out, as we might see in the discussion, you know, when it comes to who's leading the function or the capability and what their background is and therefore what kind of perspectives they bring and what kind of conversations yeah. they're good at. How about you, Paul? Um, just to, to round things off here. I thought you'd come and ask me that. Mine's different. Um, I am a lawyer. Um, so I originally started off as a lawyer in London, uh, then saw the light and joined the army. Um, and I did a um, 16 years in the army as a lawyer, um, which was fascinating actually because of the values and standards that really do run through the armed forces. Um, it was an interesting kind of experience um, looking at, the, at that site. Um, I left the army and then was in-house counsel at the home office before I then really moved into the ethics and compliance space. I started off, uh, I don't know if any Serco or on the, uh, Robert's on the call, but I worked with Robert Smith at uh, Serco as a regional head of ethics, but um, it, it was ethics. There was no compliance in the job title. So um, it, it gave me a real insight into trying to uh, leverage and influence through through that ethics job title. Uh, I then went to Centrica, uh, much more regulated, of course, uh, as the group head of ethics and compliance operations. So working with Tim Langton, um, delivering an ethics and compliance program globally uh, before uh, moving across to MOPS in September 2019. Okay, well, thank you for that. As we can see, variety is the very spice of life when it comes to where ethics is located and who ends up leading on it. So let's, um, we've got a, we've got a quick poll uh, to come now, if uh, we could put that up, please. Now, we've just been doing some research on where ethics sits in the organisation, and I know that you, you need to ask at least two or three good questions to get to the bottom of it. So this is just a quick, uh, a quick flavour of it um, and we're only allowed five options on this particular polling thing so if you could select one of the following if if it doesn't apply to where you are don't worry about it just don't bother answering if you're not sure exactly which is 
the option that best describes, just, just pick the best one, okay? So with legal compliance, with risk, with HR, with CSR sustainability, or just elsewhere. Uh, so if you could press your buttons now, please. Thank you very much. That's great. Plenty of answers coming in. And we'll be getting the results popping up any moment now. And there we are. Can everyone see that? So we've got legal compliance, as probably expected, 55%, because that covers uh, quite a multitude. Uh, you might be with compliance. You might or might not report into legal. You might be with legal. We know that things can get more complicated. Um, so there's a majority in legal compliance, but quite a spread, I think, in others as well, which is interesting. So we've got 13% uh, with risk, uh, which is something we've seen in the past. Um, it looks like you're not alone, Dominic, because we've got 4% with HR. Uh, and then we've got 6% uh, with CSR sustainability and 21% elsewhere, elsewhere. So I think that just goes to show to make the point that there's a, a wide variety of possibilities here and represented amongst members of the audience as well. So hopefully those of you who have, um, who have pressed your buttons and voted, thank you for that. You're all thinking, I wonder what it would be like to be in one of those other categories. And uh, what would be the pros and cons of not being in risk, but being in sustainability or vice versa. So let's turn to the next stage of the discussion uh, which is where I asked the panel members to say something about the perceived benefits of the way they're organised. And particularly, I think, in the case of well, all of you, you've been through, your organisations have been through a process of thinking this through. So hopefully the benefits and the disadvantages are quite fresh in your mind because you've had to think about this. I know, Paul, you've been leading on, on, on that thought as you've already introduced. So what are the, the perceived benefits of how you're organised? And what are the perceived challenges? And maybe some of those are still to be played out fully, I guess, as well. Yes, I think the first thing to, to kind of identify, and it would be an interesting to drill down into those figures we've just seen, is that we call out ethics and we call out compliance. So it is ethics and compliance. And so both, and, and I deliberately put ethics before compliance, actually in that, not the other way around. Um, and what that does, it gives both a seat at the table um, it wouldn't surprise me if a lot of the, the risk, those in risk, actually ethics perhaps isn't in the title of the organisation that sits there or the function of the capability. So that, that's one of the benefits to start with. We, we give both a seat at the table, but really it's about simplicity. I think all of us are competing for time with frontline business units. Um, what training are we delivering? Um, how is reporting done? And actually I think um, bringing the two together what it does, it enables it, um, one kind of um, resource team to get their arms around the whole thing and, and be one place to provide that support to the business. Um, so re really that, that benefit I see in terms of actually helping the business understand both ethics and compliance. I actually believe that the two in the right organisation are mutually beneficial. Um, Ethics and compliance can have both have reputational issues. The compliance piece can be seen as, as the policeman. Ethics sometimes, is it a nice to have? Is it tangible? And I think compliance can help get ethics in the room. I think sometimes what I call the crocodiles nearest the boat are always seen in the eyes of compliance. And therefore I think compliance can help get a focus on ethics. Um, I also think what ethics fundamentally does, it takes, it takes us beyond the minimum. Um, and, that, and, and, it's, and it helps compliance get beyond that minimum standard into somewhere where it's more aspirational or principles based that a business should want to be. Um, and finally, so in that programme um, that you put together, I think the two work really hand in glove. Um, and so um, you, you, take, you take a programme that's obviously based on your values. The foundation, I think, is about values, but actually you, you, you use compliance to get to the minimum standard. And then you, you almost just filter into what is then going beyond compliance and, and into um, a kind of values driven culture and ethical culture where we all do the right thing. But combining the two um, through one program, I think stops that almost splitting out. The challenge is quite straightforward, if I'm honest. The challenge is to keep ethics, a focus on ethics. I think it's really easy just for compliance to come in because it's it's, it's more tangible, it's more visible, it, it, um, it, it's clearer, it's, 
in this operates as a stop sign, do not pass go. And I think it's very easy to start. We, we're, we're competing for time. And so with, between the two, I think compliance will tend to dominate. And so I think it's really the challenge is to maintain that focus on your values, and how your ethics program is really working in the business. That that is a challenge, particularly when you put your ethics and compliance function in legal, because the natural instinct of lawyers, I think, is a compliance mindset. So actually, the challenge for the ethics and compliance team, so particularly myself as a lawyer, is, is to really reinforce ethics at every opportunity. Uh, and that's why it's actually not a coincidence that I've recruited somebody like Dan from the Institute of Business Ethics to maintain that focus on ethics in what we do, to keep us honest in relation to the ethical aspects of that program we're delivering. Um, so I think that that's the, probably the benefits and the challenges I'm experiencing. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Though you don't need to keep emphasising the point that you're nicking one of our colleagues, Paul. <laughs> I'll, I'll start sulking in a minute and stop the webinar. Um, but yeah, I think I think what you pointed to is really important, and 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 there are risks, of course. So if you had, depending on who you report into in legal and their view, and also depending on what kind of lawyer you are or the person leading ethics, you know, ethics could just be smothered at birth, really. Yes. Uh, but on the other hand, if you can pull it off, then it can be a very powerful combination, as you say, and 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 compliance can be a way of of giving ethics something to cling to in the early days. But I guess sometimes compliance is so strong for sometimes external reasons. I mean, thinking Jen in banking, I know you're not in the compliance area, but the the, the compliance burden is so large. I could imagine, at least in some banks, that ethics would struggle with a compliance function, might it? And, and might be better placed elsewhere if it's going to flourish. Yeah, I mean, I think that's it. I mean, if, if I had one of my compliance colleagues here, they would, you know, they would, you know, tell tell you how ethics is embedded into what they do um, and into, you know, all the different um, the factors into whistleblowing, into conduct, into to different parts of um, conduct and compliance. I mean, we obviously are a very heavily regulated industry um and we're you know we're an industry where we have made a lot of mistakes in the past and uh, that has you know very much been the journey of the banking sector you know, since 2008 is to ensure a real focus um on ethical um, conduct and ethical behaviors and i think that's come both through a regulatory framework but also you know internally we've really been driving that and I think that's why it, it doesn't sit with one accountable person or one accountable team. It's very much about driving it through the culture, driving it from the top down, through the board, through the, the, the leadership and, and kind of into um, into the behaviours of the people that, that work in the bank. Um, because, you know, the ethical consequences, if you like, of, of bad decisions or bad behaviour sits everywhere it sits everywhere in the bank we're so big we're so large um you know mistakes can be made at any point in time um and, and not just mistakes i guess it's the it's the what drives that to happen and um, you know we're really trying to make a shift from rules to role models um and you know i have to kind of make that that focus on you know who do we want to be who do we want to serve what do we want to achieve if you keep your purpose you know at the forefront of what you do you follow the values um then that that really integrates it into the, the thinking and behavior um so i think that's you know as i say it's very it's i see ethics being very synonymous with culture with sustainability um you know to be a sustainable bank we have to have strong ethics culture again through through all parts of the business so so yes it's it would be I think it would be really difficult to work out where, where an ethics function would sit, whether it would sit within HR or compliance um, or both or all. You know, I think if we were going to add it in, it would have to add in at multiple different touch points. Mm. And, and in yeah, terms and of the governance, yeah, do feel... does, does ethics come together anywhere or is it not a kind of an organising word and we'd have to go and look in different parts, say at board level? Yeah, I mean, I suppose, as I say, the organising word, I think, really is around um, culture um, but and within sustainability as well. But you do, you you know, you see it and hear it all the time. We had a presentation at our team um, today from, from somebody in a, a part of the business where they're, they're looking after um, customer funds and 
the first thing she said was, you know, we're doing ethical practices every day. Um, and it's it's embedded in it. But I think at the board level, we certainly have um, we have a subcommittee for culture at the moment and you know, looking at the, the behaviours that we want to embed and the frameworks that's always evolving um, is trying to get the right right behaviours. Um, and you know there but there are also there's also the sustainable banking committee which looks across you know many ethical areas and our purpose really is driving a lot of um focus on having debates and uh, around ethical issues you know the current dilemmas we've got we've updated our yes check and that really kind of helps it's a really great tool to drive any conversation then if you're looking at a, a difficult situation or, or discussion you know you use the yes check um, you know, it really probes into are you approaching this situation or this decision with the right, um, you know, with the right ethical behaviours um, and, you know, within all our board papers as well, you have to really now address right up front, how does this decision that I want the board to take um, align with our purpose and also impact all of our stakeholders. So there's, you know, there's processes and structures that are making sure that this is, um, visible throughout everything we do. Okay, thanks for that. And, and Dominic, um, you, you introduced a little bit about what happens to you now you're uh, being in HR. What, what would you think are the pros and the cons uh, of that in your organisation? Sure. I mean, um, first thing to say is I think I agree with everything that Jennifer and Paul have just said. Um, actually, it's very, very dependent on what your company is like um, as to where it should sit. And it's very, very dependent on the people that kind of run the show. Um, if you've got someone like Paul who sees the value in ethics, then having ethics and compliance together works very well. Um, the danger, is, as Paul outlined, is that if you're in compliance, you can draw a very straight line to, between if you breach this rule, there will be a $400 million fine. And that really gets people's attention. Whereas in ethics, you tend more, I mean, there's a quite a bit of federal sentencing guideline stuff in there, and DOJ stuff as, as well, but there's a lot of cultural stuff. And it's that understanding that culture is a foundational internal control that, that's so important, and it's getting that into your business. Um, the advantages for me in sitting with HR um, are that we're, we're close to a lot of those cultural levers. We're close to a lot of the places um, where we can affect that. So we're, we're close to the people who look at um, annual appraisals, annual target setting for employees. So that's uh, getting the how built into annual appraisals as well as the what. Uh, so close to that. Um, we're close to the employee survey. We're close to uh, the employee engagement piece, the climate piece, the culture piece. So we're very close to all of that. So, so that helps. Um, the key risk, I think, and, and this is interesting, so a group we sit with in HR, um, we didn't make that change in the businesses. So we have full-time ethic leads out in each of our businesses and they, they work for the chief councils and we've kept them there because firstly, they've got real teeth when working for chief councils, but secondly, if they worked in HR, people would say, well, hang on, if I phone the ethics helpline, I'm basically referring it to HR. And so many cases are HR type cases where people actually want this to be investigated independently. So you, lo you lose that perception of independence. So it's quite important that in the business, we keep it within legal. Um, so that, uh, the, the, the big disadvantage, I think, if we sat HR everywhere, is people would say, oh, it's just part of HR. Um, and, and you get that reduction in people's willingness to speak up to you. Um, Yeah, I think those are the key areas, really. Um, it's that um, it, it's keeping that closeness to the people who are in charge of the of the how, the how we work, uh, not yeah. just the what, not just the rules. Um, it's interesting. It's rather than bringing that how into compliance, it's almost keeping that how where it otherwise is, allowing compliance to do their compliance thing and just keeping very, very closely in touch with them. Yeah, that I think it's interesting. Yeah. And perception is part of it, isn't it? So, you know, what, what's mm. the way that colleagues in one organisation would perceive a location might differ from people in another organisation? Mm. I think that's uh, yeah. something 
I agree very strongly with Jennifer's point about it being throughout the organization, everybody's responsibility. It's the same as safety. Safety is everyone's responsibility. You still have yeah. safety department. Yeah, um, and I, I guess um, I guess one of the things that means is that um, you talk about the cultural levers, which is an interesting phrase, but also there's a question of how do you relate to functional leads in other areas? So you, you've obviously got very close relationship with HR. Uh, whereas if Paul wants to do something from compliance and ethics, he doesn't go to his boss, he has to manage across, I guess, and maybe grab attention. And, and that would go for other functions like procurement, for example. Um, so how so how, how do you manage to do that, Paul, that you know, you've got the strength of your base in with, with compliance and underneath legal? How do you work across to, to encourage the integration of ethics into all the organisation? Yeah, I think I think that's there's a lot of personality obviously in that depending on who are in particular roles um, but I tend to take a collaborative approach as best I can um, engaging with the relevant functions early enough so there's an aspect of ownership in what we're trying to deliver um, and so if you can get if you can get the relevant functions to buy into the idea and almost take ownership um, along the way then um, they, they almost the, the solution is a, is a joint solution. So we're going through that at the moment at Moz. We're completely rewriting our code. We're taking it from a very simplistic kind of almost word document. Um, and it's such a it's such a big effort and, and really engaging across um, multiple functions and parts of the business and, and, and front line and up to the executive board. But I think it's it, um, communicate regularly, collaborate early and, and enable people to be part of the solution would be uh, my, my thoughts on that one. Okay, yeah, wherever you sit, you've got to be able to shout. It just depends where you're shouting to, I guess. Um, it's time for another poll. Um, and um, this poll is going to be asking people uh, whether they like where they sit or their function or capability currently sits. Now, I should say, uh, no one's um, answer to this will be shown on the screen and we will keep uh, everything confidential behind the scenes so do feel uh, free to answer honestly so your current organization set up how do you rate it five very satisfied through to one very dissatisfied nice mix of answers in is, well, I was going to say it's good to see at one level we'd hope that everyone was very satisfied and uh, and very happy with where their ethics function sits, whether they work in it or they work with it. Okay, here are the results. Quarter of people very satisfied, third of people satisfied. So majority are in, in happy land here, but 16% are neutral or can't make the mind up. A full quarter are dissatisfied or very dissatisfied. Okay, so Unfortunately, on, on, a, on a webinar like this, we can't go into exploring you know, why people are very satisfied or in particular why they're dissatisfied. But I think this, uh, it would tend to show that some people are dissatisfied, so there is an, appet uh, an, uh, an appetite for change possibly on the part of some people. So hopefully already they've got some good ideas about where they would like to see uh, the ethics functional capability sit in their organisation. Um, but supposing these people had the the opportunity uh, had the mandate to change um, we've talked about some of the places they might want to go to uh, anything to say about the process of change because i always think structural change promises so much but can deliver very little at a very great cost so any thoughts on if you are going through the process of change or thinking about it how you should go about that any handy yeah just, i'm just i'm having one thought as i say i think there's many um, parallels perhaps between sustainability and ethics um, and I know that um, as a sustainability function we um, you know sustainability functions have historically sat within communications and marketing um, kind of functions and um, in the last couple of years we made the move into group strategy and I think that was you know an enormous help because that's really what we were doing is looking at the long-term sustainable strategy of the bank and advising kind of around the bank on that. And, you know, I guess I, it's, as I say, I'm not an ethics in an ethics department, but I wonder if there's just some sentiment that, um, you know, this is a strategic, 
you know, approach that needs to be applied. It's, it needs to be close to the top. It needs to be in a group wide um, function. Um, so I just wonder if that's, you know, I, I certainly think that, you know, even within sustainability coming out of a, a smaller function into the group strategy has been hugely helpful in getting us um, around the wider parts of the bank yeah. with, those, with those remits. Yeah, it's, it's sort of hitching a ride, isn't it? I think a bit like you were saying, Paul, in a way, isn't it? Your ethics hitching a ride with uh, a hospitable compliance function, if I put it that way. OK, well, I've got yeah. plenty of questions. There was a moment of panic. If you saw me panicking while you were talking uh, earlier, Jen, I apologise, but I'd lost the questions. <laughs> but uh, I found them hiding behind your faces on my on my screen. So um, I just wanted to give you enough time to for, for the audience to ask some questions. There are plenty of coming. We won't get through them all. We'll try and answer some of them after. But I'll try and pick a few uh, uh, and, and particularly group some. So one of the things that was interesting here was um, you talked about sustainability there, Jen, and, and you know, someone's asked here, you know, do you blend CSR and business ethics or do you treat them as two different components? And that was one person's interesting question. Anyone volunteering for that one? Yeah, so I mean, I think they are, diff they are different. Yeah, I mean, they are different. I mean, as I say, I don't have any direct responsibility for ethics within CSR and, and neither do any of my colleagues, but I think it's um, you know, we, we sit in, in a place where we can support and call out things, you know, as many other people can, but really kind of work across, um, you know, to, to help embed that eth ethical behaviour. But you know, my view is it, it, it doesn't sit in one place, it, it sits across everybody. Dominic, sorry, you were going to jump in. Uh, uh, sure, I mean, the core for me, the core of what ethics does is, is that people behaviour piece um, so it's it's the way we work around here which is usually encapsulated with the code and it's the governance mechanisms around that to so the policies the speak up helpline and so forth um, CSR moves more into those environmental areas and so forth it's a bit it's a bit broader and its core ethics can be quite tough can be quite these are the rules this is how we do it uh, these are the mechanisms these are the processes. Yeah, I, I quite like the, the simple um, comment that ethics is about doing things ethically. CSR is about doing ethical things. Um, and, and, and sometimes organisations can hide behind doing ethical things to be unethical to some degree. So I agree with you, Dominic. For me, the, the ethics piece is around defining your purpose. This is why you exist how you operate and how you want to be are your values, your strategy is your what, so how you go about delivering. And so your code brings them all together. So your code and values drive the strategy to deliver purpose. That's your ethical concept. Yeah, thank you, Paul. I think that hopefully answered another question we had, which is why is ethics not generally regarded as part of the SG stroke CSR plus stroke CS uh, sustainability? I guess possibly we find it more in consumer facing organisations that the two might come together where if, uh, if you are a B2C organisation, then it might matter to your customers, both that you do the right things and you do them in the right way, and they need, in a sense, a single point of reference uh, for that. So I guess that might drive some integration of those, those functions, uh, if, uh, or at least close the cooperation. But I think it's important, obviously, that, uh, that you're in touch with the CSR people if your ethics function uh, anyway. Um, one thing that has been asked here, um, which has come through in more than one question, uh, and it does touch on what we were saying really, but how do you make sure that wherever uh, ethics sits, as long as it's a separate, in some, an identifiable group or capability, how do you make sure that everyone in the organisation realises that ethics is their responsibility? That's a, a flavour of question that's come through a few times today. Sure. I mean, I, I, I'd say the same thing as I said with safety. Safety is everyone's responsibility, but you still need a safety department to set the rules, set the framework, get that understanding out there, do those communications, do the reporting, assess what's happening, assure the board that it's all working. So you need that. But yeah, absolutely, ethics is everyone's responsibility. Um, I think the key part here is, is not trying to do it all from group. So group, you set the framework, and then what we've done is hired high quality people out in the business units 
to implement that locally because for us the working environment is so different in say glasgow to where it is in saudi arabia or chicago um, that we need we need those local people who understand it to help implement that out in the business so it's not seen as a group responsibility it is seen as everyone's responsibility but absolutely right i think i don't think it's a reason not to have an ethics group though but i do think it's a reason not to sort of set up a hero cult around around one person as being the this is the person who the ethics is all about it is out there for everybody through an ethics officer network yeah i, I agree with that dominic i think for me, it's, it's getting beyond the word ethics. Um, sometimes I think the word ethics can be used a lot. It has the potential to mean different things to different people and therefore lack, can lack relevance. So you've got to try and get beyond ethics to make it relevant to all of our people in an organisation. And I think the stepping stone way of doing that is through the company's values and actually talking about the values, getting line management to have to talk about the values in team meetings and to use the values to remind our people how the values can help them with those everyday dilemmas. So if line managers talk about what well, we had this particular situation, if you've got respect in your values or integrity, how would that have helped? So you make the values real and then you start working back to ethics and people realize that's what ethics is. So to me, this it's, it's guiding me in my di everyday dilemmas and then how does it cut across different sectors um, and then I think then everyone realised how it's relevant to them and it's their responsibility. Uh, I absolutely agree with Dominic though you need something that sits able to leverage influence your group level and that oversees this in some way um, but you do need to avoid that silo mentality. I, I try and yeah. if we're talking about risks I try and get people to view ethics as, as the horizontal bar that cuts across everything and not as the vertical bar that it is that is isolated from other issues. I mean, one of, one of the, I think this is probably if you think about organization charts and this is a, a session about structure, um, you've got solid lines, you've got no lines and we've talked a little bit about how you try to influence those parts of the organization where you don't have a formal relationship. Uh, but also dotted lines have been mentioned more than once and we've had one or two questions about dotted lines here um, those might be dotted lines upwards or they might be dotted lines downwards how, how, how do you manage dotted line relationships when someone else has got the solid lines in that area i mean jen i suppose a lot of your life is is managing without even dotted lines i suppose yeah i, I think i mean we very much i mean we're a large organization but we're really trying to kind of adopt a, a one bank approach and be really agile across you know different teams so you know i certainly um in my role you have a very wide network across um call it like minded colleagues and as i say corporate governance risk hr conduct and compliance across all of those and i think it's kind of looking at the common areas that we, we want to address so you know we're really focusing at the moment on embedding purpose um and um you know aligning our strategy with sustainable development goals and it's really as you kind of tackle something you you bring that very ethical approach into what you do um and as i say into every paper you write into every kind of thing you escalate up to the board every conversation you have it comes back to is this helping us to to fulfill our purpose is this removing um, barriers that stand in the way of people's potential you know and if not let's talk about that and um and it comes out and um, so it's not explicit but it it does come out in in what we do so i think um, so so if, if you're given I suppose if you acquire or, or given a dotted line to somewhere it sort of gives you some sort of a right to say something and do things doesn't it but but how does how do you actually flesh that out you know it's one thing to be given a dotted line, it's another thing to actually use it. Any comments from you, Paul, on, on using dotted lines? Yeah, um, I mean, to be honest, it's a good, it's difficult, isn't it? Because, I mean, as I said, I, I've got a solid line into the general council and a dotted line into the executive chair. Um, I, I talk to the executive chair on a regular basis, but I include the general council on those conversations. 
is there a time I might go to the executive chair to use that dotted line and not go through the general counsel? And I suppose that's why it's there. Perhaps it, it's there because if there is something I feel I need to do that is independent of the general counsel, I have that opportunity. It's why it's not. So I, I think it's a, it's a safety net for the organisation to demonstrate the independence of its proof ethics and compliance officer from the general counsel, which makes sense. There's a lot of arguments to say that independence is necessary. Um, but it's probably not one I would actually use um, without some careful thought. Um, yeah. It's kind of your nuclear option, if, if I put yes. it that way, I guess. Whereas your dotted line, Dominic, you were talking to into the businesses was a rather, rather different one. It's a more uh, everyday um, dotted line. And so how, how do you how do you work that so you can have the influence you want, but kind of not tread on people's toes and cause trouble? In, into the businesses, yeah. I think um, having that dotted line into the business, um, or, or the, the business having dotted line to us, just means it it kind of formally opens it up for regular discussion. Uh, and what you want is those people in the business to be consulting you regularly, having those discussions, so that they don't become isolated. So they don't get the, they, they don't become making decisions by themselves, going off track. Uh, it's having those those regular consultations with groups so that they stay as informed as they can about the direction everything is going in, and they stay up to the standards of the rest of the group. Um, but it's dotted lines going go in all directions, and it it opens the door to those conversations. Um, and if you look at a kind of racy matrix, a dotted line isn't responsible or accountable. But it is consulted and informed. Yeah, because it, it works both ways, doesn't it? Mm. You know, you're looking at it from the point of view of the ethics function wanting to support, have influence on whatever those people out there, but they know also they can they can turn to you and hopefully that wouldn't be seen as a nuclear option in their case. Well, quite. Yeah, if it's a regular discussion, it isn't a nuclear option, it's just our monthly or quarterly or weekly catch-up. Yeah, I think I think if you have those regular things, then it doesn't look like the nuclear option, does it? I always remember, I think possibly on one of these webinars, someone saying, well, they always had 10 minutes with the chair of one of the board committees. That was, uh, yeah, that was, that was me at Coke. It was, um, uh, you always get 10 minutes with the chair of the audit committee, regardless yeah. of who had anything to speak about. If you've got nothing to speak about, you sit there and you have a cup of tea and you have a chat about the cats. Um, yeah. If you have something to speak about, you speak about that thing. But then it doesn't become odd if suddenly one quarter you've got 10 minutes with the chair of the audit committee with the rest of the audit committee having left the room. Yeah, so I think the, there's that notion that there is there are open channels, there are yeah. relationships. So it's not just when you have, it's, you know, so when you want to have a difficult conversation, you're already used to having a conversation, which is really yeah. important. I mean, this is, this is about where, where does ethics fit in? And we're getting towards the end and I'm looking at various questions and uh, trying to pick up some themes from these. Um, and, and we know that it can fit into all sorts of different places and there's, there's, there's pros and cons. Uh, and maybe if you've got cons, the same techniques can be used. So you've you you know you've got a close relationship with HR, Dominic, Paul, you haven't, so you're gonna have to deal with HR differently from Dominic. But then again, Dominic's away from compliance. And then Jennifer, if she wants to, Jennifer, she's, if she wants to influence anything, she's got other relationships too. But I was just thinking, is there anywhere that ethics doesn't fit in? To turn the question around the other way, you know, wouldn't there be somewhere maybe you've come across, maybe you haven't, where it'd be really weird to put ethics? I think it would be weird to put it in the sales department. I, I don't think self policing to that extent works. And I have had people say, well, shouldn't this sit in operations? That's where the issues arise. Shouldn't that be where ethics sits? And absolutely, you need an ethical presence there. But I think if you are working for the same people, as those people doing the higher risk activities for your business, then there is a risk there of a of a confusion of goals. I think there's a who watches the watchman point here, and there needs to be that real independence so that you're you're not you're not motivated by the same goals and aims, even subconsciously. Yeah. Any other offers on where not to put your ethics group? <laughs> I suppose just to build on that, I mean, I immediately kind of thought of within risk, you've got your three lines of defence. And I think there's just a different role, um, you know, for, for ethical decision making and approaches, you know, perhaps 
in, in the situation that you're in. So it's very, you know, it's very important to have um, differentiation between those three lines of defence and then even up into kind of policy, strategy and um, processes, controls and across the places. So I think it's about each area knowing knowing its approach to ethics, you know, led by the company um, and, and its values and its purpose, but really understanding what their individual role and responsibility is within ethics um, rather than it having a fit or not. I think it's 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 being situational. Yeah, yeah, I think I think so much is about um, finding a, a well thought through position for ethics knowing that there isn't one right answer but it's got to be a sensible decision that people are committed to isn't it and then understand the pros and cons of that situation so it'll bring certain advantages and you've got to equip people to deal with whatever the disadvantages are which might be you know how do you set up appropriate relationships with with other functions you know, there's an interesting question came in which said is you know, do, does it sometimes suggest with some organisations that are not taking ethics seriously because of where they put it? Uh, but maybe that's more about sort of putting them in a building at the bottom of the garden or something. I don't know if that's you know, if that's what you mean. But organisationally, I'm not sure whether you can sit some ethics somewhere that it's it's clearly not taken seriously. I think it's the organisations that consciously don't put it anywhere. Okay. Um, so I mean um, that it's just it's just a silent add-on to things. Yeah. So I, I, I think risk and compliance go together. I'm not sure I would put ethics in that group with risk, compliance and ethics. And I have seen numerous organisations, there's probably people on the call here, where risk and compliance, but it ha ethics is sitting as an add-on to com compliance within that construct. Right. I think something like that is harder for ethics to find the light um, because it has got too strong risk and compliance will both take up a lot of air time. Um, right, so, so I think basically not bigamy. We can be with risk or be with compliance, but not with both. I, I think I think the, the, the right place for ethics to be is, is anywhere in the organisation where you're able to leverage influence that everyone does the right thing aligned to a set of values. The wrong place is anywhere that doesn't allow you to do that. That's a very good summing up, Paul, and that gets me off the hook, I think, so because I have to bring things to a close and I do have some housekeeping, some of it very pleasurable. So I want to say thank you very much, Paul, Dom, Dominic and Jen for your contributions. Really appreciate them. Really appreciate your honesty and taking the time to to speak to us today. Great pleasure to uh, to work with you on this. Um, thank you also to everyone who's been watching. Uh, and just to remind you, a recording of the webinar will be available uh, in the next couple of days and we'll let you know about that. Uh, I've been re reminded by our events team that our next uh, event to mention is a training event, Understanding Business Ethics, which is basically a two week course done online, followed by uh, a live session. Uh, so if you want to know about that, please have a look at our website. Uh, there will be an opportunity to provide feedback and we'd love you to provide that because that's really important for us uh, designing our approach to webinars. So that will come round. Um, anything else you want to know, just look at the website. But thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Hope you enjoyed the webinar. Hope you found it useful. And again, many thanks indeed to the events team behind the scene and to Paul, Dominic and Jen. Thank you. <laughs>